You're listening to episode 180 of the Writing Live podcast from the National Centre for Writing, a weekly podcast for anyone who writes. I'm Steph McKenna and it's Monday the 21st of February here in a very windy Norwich as I'm recording. On today's episode, I'm joined by Matto Mandersloot, a literary translator working from Korean into English and Dutch. Matto holds a degree in classics from King's College London and one in translation from the School of Oriental and African Studies. He has won the Korea Times' 51st Modern Korean Literature Translation Award, the World Literature Today Translation Prize and the Oxford Korean Poetry Translation Prize. In July 2021, we welcomed Matto to Norwich for a month-long residency with support from the Literature Translation Institute of Korea. During his residency, he worked on Choi Jong Rai's final collection of poetry, Net of Light, alongside award-winning poet and translator George Surtees. The conversation you will hear today took place during that visit and is between Matto and George. Together, they discuss Matto's route to publishing Korean and the collection they've been working on together. So without further ado, I'll hand over to George and Matto. Well, hello, Matto. Um, We're going to be talking about what you're translating and how you came to translate and what you're actually translating, obviously. But perhaps we could start with the notion that, I mean, you're a strange thing. You're you're a Dutch guy who's translating a Korean poet into English. Um, Tell us a little bit about, well, maybe a little bit about your background to start with and then how you got into Korean. Right. Um, I grew up in the Netherlands, that's uh, completely correct, uh, until age 17, uh, because as soon as I finished my high school uh, diploma, I went straight to Korea to spend eight months uh, training with a world famous Taekwondo Grandmaster. Um, because at the time I didn't quite know what I wanted to study or anything like that. I just wanted to pursue my sports ambitions because I'd been doing Taekwondo since I was seven. And uh, it's a Korean martial art. So I figured I need to go to the birthplace of this sport. And then uh, they took me in with open arms and I was the only non-Korean member of the team. So I had to pick up the language really fast. Well, that's, that's your 17, you're saying. Yes. That's a big step for a 17-year-old. I mean, was it an easiest thing to do? Did you need support? Did you need to apply? How complicated was the procedure? Um, well, a few, a few things. Um, I guess a few things came together because through um, another Taekwondo master in the Netherlands that I knew, I got in touch with this grandmaster in Korea. So he kind of made the connection for me. But then, yeah, I was I didn't have the money to pay for the training, so I actually crowdfunded uh, the expenses needed. Uh, and that, at the time, that was really uh, that was a hype. You know, there was a, a lot of people were trying to achieve their dreams with this kind of method. Um, and but yeah, it kind of just uh, worked out, uh, if you like. Um, I got. I got to Korea um, and I started training straight away and we trained eight hours a day, seven days a week, nonstop. That was the, the, the life I was, I was aiming for. Were you already well known as a Taekwondo, um, what do you call it, an artist, Taekwondo artist, Taekwondo sportsman, Taekwondo um, competitor? Well, in Korea they call it Taekwondo in, which literally just means Taekwondo person. Uh, taekwondo human <laughs> um, but uh, uh, sadly in in Dutch and I don't know if it's the same in, in English but we use the word taekwondo ka mm-hmm. which is absolutely horrendous because ka is what is the suffix that you put for Japanese sports so we say judo ka uh-huh. which is a judo athlete and karate ka and they just copied it for taekwondo which is like out of place because it's a Korean martial art, not a Japanese one. Anyway, that's a, <laughs> I'm digressing. Um, I was fairly known, I guess, in the sense that I'd won a few competitions. I'd been the national youth champion before and I wanted to aim higher and go for the Europeans or the world. So that's why I wanted to train in Korea and um, improve my skills. And your name was well enough known. So that when you applied for this on crowdfunding, yeah. I said, oh yes, yes. Yeah, he's a Taekwondo champion. Yes, we'll help him because going to Korea 
would improve his taekwondo, yeah? Yeah, that's the way it went. So at the time that you went, um, was there any other purpose in mind? Did you particularly want to visit Korea? Did you know anything about Korea or about its language? Uh, not much, no. I was, I was quite um, ignorant about, about Korea. I just, uh, I had in mind I want to train, I want to fully dedicate myself to the sport and the rest kind of came as I went along. Um, so as I was training, I realized that learning the language was not only necessary because I was the only member of the team that didn't speak Korean. So there were nobody spoke English, but it was also a huge joy. Like I really enjoyed learning the language and I, I guess I picked it up quite fast because I started to realize maybe I want to do something with this language as a career instead of uh, you already had a background in languages to some extent i mean 17 you're still a schoolboy you're finishing school yeah um, but um, were you in fact uh, somebody who was particularly interested in languages before yeah I, I think i didn't realize that until i went to korea but uh, i did a school where latin and greek are part of the curriculum um, so i kind of and then uh, of course um, in the Netherlands you have to do French and German as part of your high school curriculum as well so by the time I'd already been exposed to Dutch English French German Latin and Greek uh, to start with so it's, it's and, a quite a big basis did yeah. that make it easier do you think to pick up Korean well in a way learning a language from scratch like Latin and Greek uh, is useful for learning any language because you kind of get accustomed to acquiring kind of linguistic building blocks. Um, but having said that, Korean is a totally different um, animal, if you like. But, but, but describe Korean a little bit. Yeah. Maybe the impression it made on you and what it was like as a learning process. What kind of things did you have to learn that you would not have had to learn with the other languages? So I guess the main difference is that in the Korean language there are many levels of politeness that is a totally foreign concept to speakers of European languages, I guess. The only thing that is like comparable is that in some European languages you have a formal U and a, and a informal you like vous and tu in French and there's obviously many um, kind of equivalents in, in other languages but in Korean uh, in every sentence that you say out loud at the ending of the sentence you'll have to sort of indicate the relationship you have towards the listener if you're speaking so if you're lower in rank or if you're trying to res like indicate respect towards the listener you would use a totally different form of the verb than if you're uh, speaking to a child. Okay, but the verb comes at the end. Yes. So it's a highly inflected language, Korean. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so you can say, you can express a degree of courtesy by the verb ending. Yes, that but, right? but, that, yes. but that's, uh, it, that took some time to get used to because I was totally um, unaware of such I don't know. How do you know who to respect? Yeah. <laughs> how do you know who respects you? This is a uh, probably in Hungarian too, but that's another question. Yeah. So um, you are, I tell you one of the things that um, I remember we talked about, it surprised me that Korean uh, didn't have a tonal aspect. Mm. Um, so because I was expecting it to. Um, what is Korean related to in terms of languages? That's another a very interesting question um, because many uh, linguists uh, claim that it's kind of on its own, on a little island, linguistic island. Um, they have uh, kind of argued that it's part of the Altaic language family, which then uh, has links to, uh, as some uh, linguists will claim to Finnish or either even Hungarian is considered to be part of that kind of branch of, of linguistic families. Um, but yeah, there's, there's no other kind of language that is closely connected to Korean in that sense. Right. Um, are there, 
I mean, are you a fairly isolated sort of uh, example of somebody who speaks Korean in in uh, the Netherlands? Or I don't imagine it's a language much taught or much spoken. Uh, it's getting more popular. Uh -huh. There are uh, a lot of universities who now offer degrees in Korean studies. This is not uh, K-pop, is it? <laughs> uh, well, it definitely played a big role. I think the, the, the Korean wave, as they call it, the kind of rise of popular Korean culture has really helped to, um, well, kind of peak an interest of a lot of people in the, in the Korean language. So in, in the Netherlands, there is uh, a, a degree in Korean studies at Leiden University. And in the UK, you have one at Oxford, in Sheffield, um, where many places where people study the language now. Um, but I would say, in, even in the Netherlands now, um, there's only one other uh, translator who translates directly from the Korean, um, as far as I know. Um, and he is uh, an academic who teaches at Leiden uh, for the degree of Korean studies. So he doesn't have much time to dedicate to translation. So basically... Oh, you have a job for life. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's... Tell, tell me one more thing about the language and then we'll start moving on to the notion of translating... Um, becoming a literary translator as opposed to, say, an interpreter or a other kind of official translator. Um, is there a different Korean for literary use or written use as apart from the demotic use, everyday street use? Um, so there is a distinction between spoken Korean and written Korean, uh, for starters. And um, the written form can be more or less formal. Um, but the, the, the great thing is, and that's especially true for uh, Cha jong -nae's poetry, uh, which I'm translating, is that you can kind of play with that. So even if it's a, a written poem, sometimes you can throw in pieces of spoken Korean, which the reader will automatically pick up as, oh, this is somebody talking to someone else, because you can, you can immediately see the verb ending and see, oh, this is a, a spoken sentence. Well, this will lead me to another question about translation, but I wonder if I can get through it a slightly different route. So you are there, how, how long did you spend there in the first place? When I was there to do yeah. Taekwondo, yes. it was just eight months. Okay. Was it very good for your Taekwondo? Did you improve much? I did. <laughs> yeah, massively. Uh, and by the time you left, um, had you already formed um, the thought that you might want to translate from this language? Yes. Uh, it grew on me, uh, but it came, funnily enough, because my dream of becoming the world champion in Taekwondo was kind of crushed at some point, uh -huh. because I realized that there's so many Koreans who are way better uh, at this sport than I'll ever be, kind of that, that um, epiphany came at some point and I had to admit to myself, okay, I'm trying to uh, beat Olympic champions and, uh, and that might be uh, a bit ambitious. But because I came to this realization, I started to think, is there something here that I'm really kind of, that I have a natural ability for? And then I thought, oh, these, this, this knack for languages might be actually useful in, in the long run. And I'd never even thought about it before going to Korea. Well, that's an interesting way around. So you're asking yourself, what might I have a talent for mm. in Korean? Rather than saying there are specific Korean books or Korean authors I very much want to translate. Right. Is that right? So it came around that way. Yes. So you're looking for some views to put your you know, newly acquired skill too. So then how did you decide and when did you decide um, that you would be a literary translator and what sort of books were you immediately drawn to translating? I guess um, having the background of um, studying Latin and Greek uh, I already knew that translation is a sort of creative endeavor and um, that translating poetry and translating literature, it, it requires a lot of ingenuity from the translator. And that's what I found most interesting, if you like. So when I started to think about, okay, I might want to translate as a career, I was immediately drawn to the idea of translating 
literature. And um, well, I, I actually haven't uh, completely answered your very first question, how I came to translate into English, mm -hmm. because then when I left Korea, I uh, came to university in the UK. So I spent five years studying uh, tr translation and Korean studies in, in the UK. And as part of the course, uh, we obviously translated some of the, um, the works that we studied. So it came, uh, came kind of naturally that I wanted to continue that route and translate into English. And by now you have translated a number of things. I think you said you have translated some fiction as well. Is that right? Yes, correct. Yeah. yeah. Tell me a little bit about the fiction, how you came to translate it. That's uh, a story that is also related to Norwich, actually, because at the time I was uh, completing a mentorship, uh, an emerging translators mentorship that is offered by uh, the Writer Center here. And my mentor, Deborah Smith, who was one of the great translators of Korean literature, um, uh, was also the series editor for a collection of short stories that was being published. And she then um, kind of asked me to get on board and translate one of the stories. Um, and afterwards, I've translated a number of novels uh, from Korean to Dutch also, um, and then a number of poems from Korean to English. Well, now you're translating poems. Yes. Um, and you are translating um, the poems of, now you'd better get, you better give the proper pronunciation, because this is somebody who I call Chong Gray. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure I'm not doing it quite justice. It's uh, Che Jong Ne. Right, I'm definitely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a long way wrong. Of it's course, hard, it's hard. Yes, because I, know, I, I did, of course, meet her and, and we, we became friends. Um, she never corrected me. <laughs> she, <laughs> she was very sweet. Yeah. Um, okay, so you came across um, her poetry. How did you come across it? She was doing a residence at the National Centre for Writing at the time uh, in 2018, and I was studying in London. So SOAS organized a reading where she um, presented some of her poems from the one collection that uh, is bilingual. So some of her poems have been published in a bilingual edition. And uh, it was one of these cases where I was just immediately gripped. Um, and so after the reading, I devoured all of her poetry. Like she published maybe five collections by then. And within a month, I, would, I worked my way through everything that she ever put on paper. Uh, well, this would be a very good moment to read something by her, perhaps, sure. and for us to hear some Korean. So maybe you do that. Choose a poem, read it first in Korean, and then in your translation. Okay. This poem is the first poem I've ever translated by, by her, um, which I submitted for the Oxford Korean Poetry Translation Prize um, in 2019. And it ended up winning the prize. Wonderful. Yes. Oluk <laughs> dolluk. 말해볼까? 말해도 될까? 망설이는 사이 그는 에스컬레이터에 실려 올라가고 나는 내려가고 있었다. 중계를 받고 타고 뛰어 올라갈까? 분명 그 얼굴인데. 어깨는 가라앉고 몸통은 굵어졌고 무엇보다도 다른 표정의 인간이 된 그. 그가 진 비닐봉투 속에 우르사약 상자가 흔들리며 따라가고 있었다. 그러나 이런 생각, 범볕 바다 길에 누운 나무 그림자, 그림자 밟고 지나가면 잠시 내 몸에 얼룩덜룩 올라섰다가 에라 모르겠다, 다시 눕는 나무 그림자처럼. 이런 생각은 길 위에서나 잠깐, 잠깐 하고 우리는 계속해서 가던 길이나 가는 것겠지. 종이컵에 빨대 꽂아 꼽이나 종이컵에 빨대 꽂아 꽃비나 주스를 빨면서 빈컵 바닥을 빨대로 더듬다가 마지막 공기 빠지는 소리 들리면 껍 구겨 내던져 버리면서. No one question I had about that before you read the English. Yes. Yeah. Which is you were saying that in Korean the verbs always come at the end. Correct. Of, of the sentence. Yeah. And it sounded to me when you were reading that that a lot of the um, sounds at the end of what I heard as lines mm -hmm. um, and with an a ah or mm -hmm. ta. Sorry, is that because of the verbs coming at the That's end? That's the verb ending, yes. So 
the present tense verb is just a nian, an n sound and ta, and the past tense verbs is otta or atta. Yeah. So you have a series of natural rhymes, which are kind of just part of the fact that it's written in Korean. Right. right. Do the Koreans consider them to be rhymes as such? Not at all. No, I think it's more a, a great challenge of Korean poetry is how to not end every line with ta. Like you have to kind of uh, get a natural flow and, and use lines where you don't have to put the verb at the end. Yeah. yeah, I think other languages have similar problems with yeah. having repeated sounds at the end. Yeah. Um, and the other question, which is simply to do with the sound of the Korean, was um, how far is there a kind of a kind of metric or a kind of uh, regularity involved? Are there specifically uh, poetic meters that mm. um, the poem that you read are employing? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, Chaejongne doesn't really use meter at all. Um, there are poetic forms where uh, the number of syllables is fixed and the stressed syllables, and um, so that's called sijo, which some people call the Korean version of a haiku. But that's, uh, I mean, that's a. Uh, I don't agree with that comparison. It's a, it's a different type of thing. But it is comparable in the sense that the syllables are always the same number in every line. Okay. Yeah. Okay, now can you read it to us in your translation? Yes, of course. Zebra lines. Shall I? Can I say hi? A moment's hesitation as he rides the escalator up and I ride it down. Shall I turn round and run up? Pretty sure it's him. His shoulders sagging. His torso rounded and I remember. He wears an expression on his face that I don't know. In his plastic bag trailing behind, a box of wellmen wobbling around. These thoughts of mine, as if stepping over the shadow of a tree cast on a sunlit road, zebra lines climb up my body. Ah, forget about it. They lie back down. My momentary thoughts, they come to the surface while we continue to go our separate ways. You sip whatever is in your paper cup, and when you reach the bottom, at the sound of slurping air, you squash and toss it. Do you think that, uh, that sounds great? Um, I can see why you would have won a prize for it. What is unusual, or what is specific, if you like, about uh, her poetry um, that is kind of evident in the piece you've read? How would you characterize her work? It's a part of her distinct style that she always creates a kind of cinematic moment to draw you into the poem. I think every single of her poems is a kind of scene in itself. And so for this one too, it starts with, shall I, can I say hi? Mm -hmm. So it immediately, I mean, she's asking herself a question or the narrator is, um, and you immediately feel that there's this kind of setting. There's a moment of, where the narrator is 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 wondering, oh, can I make a move? You know, that's that's the kind of the, the immediate the urgency, if you like, of this first line is is so great. That's what I really like about her work. And then uh, later, you get a sense of this other thing where I mentioned that sometimes there's spoken Korean that uh, kind of um, jumps on on the scene. Um, when when they, when she says ah forget about it, that's a, that's a very spoken line and uh, it's it's right in the middle of a stanza full of kind of almost philosophic thought uh, and that kind of juxtaposition that contrast is is what I really like about her work. So yeah, so part of her work or some part of what characterizes it is this uh, movement, if you like, setting a scene and then moving out of it, considering the scene as though we were the writer rather than a character within the poem. Yes. yes. So there is a kind of shifting through the poem of the voice from, if you like, uh, setting up something mm. and then moving somewhere else, slightly yes. to one side or other. Yeah, it's amazing how she manages to move back and forth between the physical world around us and the metaphysical world, like where she thinks about um, like ideas and, and um, uh, which is kind of more like 
pon pondering life about life. Um, but I, I find it very, very interesting how almost all of her poems are um, kind of inspired on, on actual events. Like she usually just talks about very everyday things and usually they are things that she's experienced herself, like they're experiences from her own life. But then she uses them as a stepping stone for um, kind of contemplation and reflection. And that's very, yeah, it's very touching. It seems to me a little bit when I read her poems and, you know, when you speak about them, that there is a sense of the world in disorientation to mm. some degree. I don't know, it's not exactly alienation from it, but there's a sense that um, the nature of things is to be disruptive and to change, yes? Yeah. So it feels kind of, it feels edgy. And that maybe, yeah. is that what gives it its power, do you think? It's yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah. She once said in an interview that she thinks that one of the tasks of poetry is to make us realize that we don't know what we think we know. And I really agree with that. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'll go with that. <laughs> but everybody does it in their own way. Yeah. Um, so in her own um, universe of poetry, there's, a, there's, if you like, the everyday world, the ordinary world. And there's a sort of movement out of it in which one watches oneself within that world. But that could take you in her poems um, into quite surprising territories sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah. So a completely different place, etc. Um, but it holds together remarkably well, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, what is the most difficult thing about translating? Or is, there, is there any specific difficulty about translating her in particular? Okay, I was going to say, <laughs> there's so many things that are different, difficult about translating. But um, in, in the case of Che Jung Le's poetry, um, I think getting the images across is is crucial like she works with very vivid imagery and sometimes the korean language can be very economical so the the she conveys this image in the span of a single line and because there are no articles there are no like unnecessary words and then as soon as you get the translating the line just drags it starts to stretch out and getting uh, kind of narrowing the image back down to a um, uh, uh, compact and, and powerful line is sometimes very hard. How does she fit amongst her contemporaries? Mm. I mean, I don't know how much, uh, I, I imagine you've read a fair amount of Korean poetry, unlike most of us. <laughs> so um, how does she fit in this kind of map of what's happening? So she published her first collection in 1994 and that sets her towards the end of a rise of female poets. In the, in the 1980s, uh, there was a huge uh, surge of um, feminist poets and they got quite, um, uh, quite some attention and critical acclaim. And um, she kind of uh, emerged onto the scene right at the end of this first boom of, of female poets. So critics will often mention her in one breath with Kim Hae-soon, who is also a very, uh, internationally now a pretty uh, famous poet. Mm -hmm. um, um, and uh, she herself said she was quite influenced by Che Sun ja who I don't think many readers will know, but there is a, an English collection coming out this year, I think, uh, by her as well. So um, she's a very modern poet, and um, I think that she did. Uh, she took in um, the her her predecessors, like the the main Korean poets of the, of the great canon, if you like. Um, but she then goes in a quite different direction. Like she, I think her style is distinct in that it is very relatable like it doesn't feel like she's trying to be um highfalutin uh, no 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 she doesn't sound at all highly literary she yeah. doesn't sound like a polemical poet either no she's no. it's very personal if you like like her her poetry seems to just sometimes they're just musings uh they're they're they could be part of her diary yeah yeah um is there any kind of 
influence of Western poetry, mm. in Korean poetry. So is there likely that would she have been reading American or other, or even Dutch poets? Um, so she said she uh, always read English literature in translation. So um, I, I think I once read that she was a huge, hugely touched by The Great Gatsby or like one of the uh, other great novels from, from the um, from the canon, the English canon. Um, but I'm not sure about poetry. I don't think she's had, I don't think if you read her work, uh, you'll be reminded of other English poets, not to that extent. But what is great to know about her is that she did start to translate English poetry. Uh, so she actually published a collection of prose poems by James Tate. And I think she just did it because she was drawn to it. Like she, she would have liked James Tate, I think. Yes, exactly. So she read his work and then uh, she, uh, she felt the urge to translate it. And then she found a publisher to... Um... Well, very sadly, we have to say, she died. She died yes, we last say. year. Um, and she died quite young, really. Yes. You got to know her personally, didn't yes, you? Yes, yes. Okay. And you got to know her before her illness, is that right? Yes, I actually met her when she was doing her um, residency at the, at the Writer Center. Um, and then, um, um, so that was 2018. And then when I moved to Korea, 2019, uh, she kind of welcomed me with open arms. Um, I, I kind of uh, sent her an email before, before moving um, because we stayed in touch in the meantime over email. And then we quickly decided to set up a weekly meetup where we would exchange poetry. So she was working on the James Tate poems at the time. And um, she would sometimes ask me questions about, um, uh, you know, a line or two. And in exchange, I would uh, kind of present some poems that I was working on. So this became a kind of uh, back and forth. And um, it soon became my favorite day of the week because it was just so exhilarating to be working with her. But you didn't have that long because then she falls ill. Yes. So that, yeah, a few months later um, when I, uh, yeah, it was early 2020. So I'd been in Korea for a few months. She, um, she got diagnosed with a, a rare blood disease, a blood, type of blood cancer. And then yeah, that was the start of a long fight against the disease, which she ended up sadly losing. And you're translating not her poems of generally, you're translating her last book to be published in her lifetime, is that right? That's right. Um, so that book came out at the end of last year, end of 2020. Um, so she did see it in print, luckily. Before the book came out, uh, she sent me the manuscript because she really wanted this book to be translated. Uh, I think she was very keen on having a wide readership for it. And I started reading the manuscript and tried my hand at a few poems and sent them to her uh, when she was uh, trying to recover from treatment. And we kind of worked on them together a little bit. She gave me a few comments. And then I ended up submitting them for the Korea Times uh, Poetry Prize, which is an annual prize in Korea. And they ended up winning. So uh, at that time, too, she was in hospital. Um, so. I called her to tell her the news, and even though her voice was very weak and, and feeble, uh, she sounded very enthusiastic and, and, and happy about the news. So I'm very glad to have had that moment uh, with her. Well, she was a very delightful person. She was. It was absolutely. a pleasure and an honor to know her. So are you translating the book in the order in which the poems appear in the book? Um, I kind of went about in a random order, just by, by poems that kind of struck my attention uh, and, and, and then started from there. But I am aiming to, to do the entire collection because, uh, because yeah, uh, it's, it's right here. Um, I think uh, there is a kind of meaning to it as a, as a whole. Like I, th I feel like this one in particular, she um, tried to tie things together maybe even you know knowing that she wasn't she was already ill when the 
when the book came out. So for her, it must have also felt like a. So the order her, of the poems is a, is a substantial matter. And, and yeah. So that there's a kind of narrative sequencing in some ways. Too. Exactly. She also writes uh, prose poems. Are there prose poems in the book too? Yes, there are quite a few. Uh, I think it's it might be like thirty percent of the of the whole oh, book is, lot, is prose it? poems. Yeah. Okay. And has the book had a good reception in Korea? Um, well, the weird thing is in Korea um, there is a lot of poetry being published. Like relatively, I've I've heard that sales are actually quite good compared to other countries where poetry is usually very unpopular for in, in the bookshops at least um, and so I'm not exactly sure uh, how how well this book has sold but I, I do know from one of her good friends who's also a poet uh, Lee Sum Young uh, who organized a memorial service after her death that it is being considered as like her her greatest work from from her career it, it kind of brings together her 30 years of, of writing poetry in, in a in a small collection that's wonderful isn't it um, how are you getting on with it you how much have you done roughly so far um, I might be halfway or something that's quick that's yeah really fast um, I think the residency uh, made a huge difference in that sense because um, I'm someone who likes to work and and kind of get absorbed into a particular translation so um i have to kind of eliminate all distractions and just get into a flow and i think in this sense um the the residency facilitates such facilitates the the kind of zone that you need to get it's in. like a monastic yes uh, <laughs> like secluded from from the outside uh hubbub yeah. So no distractions? No, correct. Yeah. Are you a very disciplined translator? Do you set particular hours for working? Well, I used to, but in this residency setting, I don't have to anymore because it's kind of as if the process takes over. Like it, it, it's, it's almost automatic. I don't have to remind myself to take a break at, at this point and then get back to it and then um, kind of have a, a time schedule, if you like. It's just... I get started and from then on it's just onwards, you know, straight on. Um, and and I don't, yeah, it's, it's, it's astonishing. <laughs> but I, I, well, it's if, very good. That's, 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 pretty, that's really pleasing to hear. And is there still room for Taekwondo? Um, not as much as I would like. Um, when I was in Korea, I did um, revisit my old grandmaster and I trained with them when I had the time. Um, but translation takes up a lot of time, as you will know. <laughs> uh, so sadly, my my sports career has been put on hold. Do you find as you're translating that you build up some momentum? So when you've done three or four, the fifth one might be a little bit come a bit more quickly. Yeah, uh, absolutely, and that's why I think um, having a month where you can just dedicate yourself yeah. to one work and not to other ones. Uh, uh, really makes a difference because it's like watching a movie. If you're watching a movie and then suddenly somebody rings the doorbell and you have to go and address this problem and then come back, you sit down and you're like, what was that about again, the movie? I, where, where were we? You, you kind of you lose track of the plot. And um, I feel that's the same way with the, with the translation. I kind of, I have to get started and then work my way through in one sitting almost. Like it's just one big effort. Um, and if I have other projects that I need to take care of, or if you know people um, drag me into other uh, endeavors, then um, I lose the the flow. Sure, sure. Um, and you're not you're not a stranger to Norwich. You've been here before, and you're not a stranger to England because you studied for six, seven years. Five think? years. Five, five years. Total. Five years. So it's a sort of very kind of. Uh, happy place of being familiar enough but not so completely familiar as to be yeah boring <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah exactly yeah. have you enjoyed being in Norwich I have uh, it's been well massively productive but also I have felt a, a strange sense of nostalgia like you said because I've I've been here before and I've been here when my translation career was just 
getting started. And now I'm... Well, you're probably sitting in the same sofa she herself sat at yeah. some stage. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, at the time I was, I was just, you know, um, setting my first steps onto the path of, of a career in translation. And now that I'm a bit further afield, um, I, it feels great to be back here. You don't have a contract for the book yet, because that's not how poetry works generally. But um, yeah. so you'd be in a position to start looking for a publisher well, within the year, maybe? Yeah, yeah, that could work, That's uh, good hopefully. One, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Once I have enough poems to compile a, a sample, uh, I think it'll be worth seeing if there's any interest. I'm going to ask you one more question yeah. before we get on and be lovely to finish with another reading from, from her poetry. Yeah. So this is a question which I might have asked at the very beginning, but I didn't, which is a question of your Dutch. You're translating her into English. Yes. Um, are you translating her into Dutch as well? I haven't. I haven't uh, translated her yet. For some reason, um, I just kind of naturally, I was naturally inclined to translate her into English. It's going very well. So I don't know if it, it's worth trying to, find a home for these poems first uh, and and make sure that they have uh, that the English readership has access to these poems and then see if I can in uh, find interest uh, with Dutch publishers because the thing is Dutch publishers usually um, follow in the footsteps of, of English publishers if there's no president uh, precedent um, then Dutch publishers will be hesitant to kind of take up would it be very different I said it was going to be my last question, but here's another one. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> would, you, would it be very different translating her into Dutch? Would there be any, um, would, would you have to do anything differently? I think so, um, because I built these translations, like I said, around images. So sometimes I would really just zoom in on a particular image that she creates inside in a poem and then make sure that that image is conveyed and then uh, kind of built the, the other lines that s support the rest of the poem. And those images can be very kind of language specific. So uh, if that image doesn't work in Dutch, then I'll have to start from scratch for the entire poem. Yeah. Okay, well, I think this is a very good time to hear one of her poems in English, in your translation, yeah. and to say thank you very much, Marto. Thank you. Um, so I thought it'd be nice to end with the last poem from her last collection. Um, it's a very short poem, but it's very, very powerful. It's heavy also. This poem is called One Milligram of Anesthetic. One milligram of anesthetic put me to sleep, sending me wandering across glaciers, having to scale an iceberg ascending a mountain of unused drugs. One milligram was too heavy. Clinging on to just one milligram, I struggled to move up. I wanted to shrug it off, that one milligram. It was so heavy. Mom, 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 I called my late mother. And the wide open glacier echoed back. Terrific. Thank you very much, Martha. That's great. Yeah, that does sound very much like a last poem, doesn't it? It, it's yeah, it's a very conclusive poem, if you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very personal poem too. Thanks for listening, and thanks to George and Matto for joining us today. If you have any questions or you want to get in touch, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Writers Centre. We're on Facebook, and you can find out more about our events, workshops, and online resources at nationalcentreforwriting.org.uk. As a UK registered charity, we rely on the generosity of our supporters to make our work possible. You can make a donation over on the website by going to the Support Us page. Thanks again, keep writing, and we'll catch you on the next episode. <laughs>